Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Well, it'll take a few minutes to have our other panelists join us, but we expect him shortly. Uh, but without further ado, I'd like to welcome you to the Truth in the Age of COVID-19, Three Steps to Combat De Disinformation webinar. And we are so pleased that you can join us during these very difficult times. This is the first in a series of dialogues with DEXIS where we convene leading voices and ideas on provocative topics in global security and stabilization. For those of you new to DEXIS, we are a consulting company that focuses on management and technical solutions in global security based on data and learning in our work in 70 countries with amazing partners, some of, some of whom are in the audience today. And we chose today's topic in the first days of the pandemic when disinformation on COVID-19, its origins, treatment, spread, and cure went viral and we saw the physical harm that that disinformation could do. Disinformation, as you, many of you know, is an inherently complex topic. It has a long history before the age of social media and COVID-19, and it relies on psychology, cognitive science, society, and people to mitigate its impact. It's also part of today's new information warfare, from conflicts in Georgia and Ukraine to inter-ethnic violence. And its intent is to take a kernel of truth and alter the context, mislead, magnify divisions that exist, create discord, and erode people's trust in institutions, leaders, and the truth. It's used for political gain and geopolitical influence, and there are no simple solutions. Many of us are familiar with the disinformation narratives at play, but today we wanna to move beyond talking about the problem set, talking out beyond defining what disinformation is and its negative impact. We want to leave on a more hopeful note and ask ourselves, what can we start doing about it? And we are very fortunate to have three inspirational panelists to discuss this very issue. They will share their perspectives on approaches that work together in tackling information. And we look at these three approaches from the beginning, which is the analytical aspect. You know, what can we find out about the sources, patterns, information flows, and uh, actual narratives of disinformation through technology and other means? And the second is creating public awareness through activities that are happening in different countries that bring on a whole of society approach media literacy, fact checking, getting governments to talk with civil society and, and creating broad scale public awareness. The third is engaging audiences in a creative, powerful, impactful way uh, through tactics like information, um, ed education, entertainment. We'll, we'll hear a lot more about that too. And uh, first I'll introduce our panelists and apologies for the few minutes of technical uh, delays. We are trying to get three different countries together so that uh, sometimes takes longer. Well, I'll introduce our panelists and each will talk roughly for about 10 minutes. And if anyone's going over too much, you might see a you know, signal that's a little bit um, uh, not so obvious. <laughs> if I, and, um, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. But I'm sure you have questions as all the panelists are talking. So please go ahead, put as many questions as you can in either the chat or Q&A function. We'll be sure to answer as many of, of them as you can. Um, the other thing is that, you know, this is, Dexas's role is to facilitate a provocative dialogue, but opinions are opinions of the speakers and of the participants. We don't, we, we support provocative dialogue, but we're not endorsing anything that might be overtly political. Um, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce our panelists, and we will start with those that are here, and then as, uh, as our Georgian colleague joins us later, we'll introduce him separately when he joins. So first, joining us from the beaches of South Carolina is entrepreneur Ryan Patterson. He's the CEO and founder of a small business and many other businesses, IST Research. IST brings advanced technological prowess to detect different disinformation in a range of complex operating environments. Ryan has over 20 years of experience in leadership positions, including in the US Marine Corps serving in Iraq and Afghanistan, and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, otherwise known as DARPA. And he's a mathematician. Following Ryan will be our Georgian colleague, Pata Gabrindashvili, and, and we'll introduce him when he joins, so you'll have a chance to, uh, and he'll be our second speaker. Um, then from LA, we're really pleased to introduce Johanna Blakely, Managing Director of the University of Southern California Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, the Norman Lear Center. Norman Lear Center studies social, political, and economic 
impact of entertainment and media. Joanna is also the co-principal investigator of the Media Impact Project that seeks to better understand media's role in changing knowledge, attitudes, and behavior in individuals and communities around the world. She oversees research and evaluation for State Department cultural exchange programs called the American Film Showcase, the Middle East Media Initiative, and has taught master's level courses on popular culture and transmedia storytelling. So thank you very much again. And I have the pleasure of uh, giving the mic to Ryan to start us off. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Ryan Patterson. I'm the CEO of IST Research. And uh, Tamara asked me to, to think about talking through how we use data uh, to help combat dis disinformation. And, and I'll, I'll go back uh, just a little bit to my days in, you know, in DARPA. Uh, I went to Afghanistan about 10 years ago and walking down uh, the streets of some of the markets in eastern Jalalabad, we came to the realization that there was just no, there was no mechanism for sort of an active, continuous, and robust engagement with those populations across digital media. Um, we had a lot of really bad preconceived notions about literacy and tech penetration and things like that. Um, but that experience, uh, I brought that back as I left DARPA, uh, took those ideas forward um, as, as we ramped the company up. And, and one of the things that we were looking at was, you know, what are those systematic measures? And, and so we've spent about the last decade um, working on developing a platform and, and more than just a platform for us, it's a mix of technology and uh, tradecraft uh, is what we would call it. Uh, but it's the sort of the, how you get a population engaged and talking and understand what's, what's true, what's real, what's, what's bot like. Um, and so the platform has three major components. And uh, for us, uh, the, the centroid of our design is around population engagement. And there's a couple of pieces of uh, population engagement that are important for everybody to understand. Uh, for us, one, the first one is that you often don't continue a conversation on the same channel that you start a conversation on. Sometimes we've got to use folks like Joanna who have rich media content distribution mechanisms uh, where big thoughtful ideas can get out um, and then help people move from from that modality to another modality where the conversation can, can continue um, we're also real big believers in the fact that you've got to reach people on the technology they have in their pocket um, we have seen and we operate all over the globe but there is a high heterogeneous population that uses very different types of technologies um, in different parts of the world. We've also, we've actually found that different people will use different technologies for different topics that they want to talk about. There are certain conversations that we will have in WhatsApp that we will not have in text message. Uh, if we need to get as secure as possible, we move over to Signal. Um, but you find things like Line, Viber, GeoChat, uh, WeChat, Telegram and other other forms of communication all over the world, and they're very regionally dependent and security dependent. Um, just think about your own model of who you talk to on what channels. And I'm betting there's very different channels you use for very different conversations. So, so we start with there with that process, and our goal there is to have both automated communications, so bot-like behavior to to start conversations with people, semi-automated. Uh, engagement where one person can can carry on a hundred different conversations and then full human in the loop where a human can step in and, and pick that conversation up and so for us that's population engagement we spend most of our time thinking in that place but in the world of the information environment you've got to quickly move into what we call social listening this is the big media this is what's on the surface of the web things that are indexable um, and, and understand how those things play together um, this is looking at all the social media surface deep and dark web um, and being able to collect information there at scale uh, across a number of different um, keywords people voices channels discussions you put the the data science on top of that with our own, own content discovery. And those are places where you can help detect when a conversation has moved from an open channel to a closed channel, or when the conversation has moved off of written text onto pictures with handwritten text, um, and the ability to detect when things, uh, when things change rapidly. We bring all those, all of those together and there's a, and there's a really interesting tipping and queuing mechanism that, that has to happen um, between the two of those. You know, so for us, we can start in a place we've never been 
begin to collect on the social listening side of things, understand what the major voices are, understand what the, what the topics that they're talking about, and then use that to design surveys and other population engagement uh, techniques. And, and for us, that, that the populate, the bringing the social listening and population engagement together helps us fill gaps where we don't have information otherwise. So there might be a black hole on the social listening side that we need to go back and directly engage with populations. A lot of people say, well, how do you do that? You know, what's, why will people talk to you? Um, you know, we, we've studied a lot of different mechanisms, sort of small micro transactions to get people to do a survey. Um, but we found that the world's population is a very participative group and they will jump into a conversation and they will talk about things that are meaningful to them. Um, and you can harvest and pull those two things together uh, in ways that provide you interesting insight. So when, like everybody probably on this call as the COVID pandemic began to emerge, we were really interested in what could we use, how could we use our platform and our techniques around the world to start to get at things. And just to give you some idea of scale and scope for us, um, we started off and I just challenged the team, like I wanna see how many people we can reach in the shortest period of time and, and get to a place where we start to get at uh, some understanding of what information they're getting and what, what misinformation they might be getting. So we spent five days, we received 300,000 responses from 40 countries. Um, in eight different languages to a 25 question survey. And we looked at things like what medications are they using? What comorbidity is there? What health education are they receiving in the process? And, and, and various other conditions related to the COVID-19 uh, breakout. Um, that entire mechanism of 300,000 responses cost us end to end about $9,000 to execute. We also do some work in, in counter human trafficking um, and we wanted to look at what were the impacts of, of, the, of the virus on, on essentially overseas Filipino workers. Um, and so again, we, we were able to touch 6,000 overseas Filipino workers in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, UAE, Qatar, Bahrain, Oman, and others to understand what was the impact of the virus uh, on them. Uh, and then we went to look at uh, domestic violence in South America. And so 10,000 responses from Ecuador, Brazil, Venezuela, Peru, and other South American countries trying to understand um, what was happening, were things we were seeing in the media true to things that we could get directly from, uh, uh, from the folks on, on the ground. So for us, you know, we then get into, you know, what does this mean for the larger disinformation fight? Um, how do how do we get into how do we get into a place and 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 become robust participants in in countering disinformation? I say this all the time. It's it's one of sort of the the soapboxes I stand up on right now. For the United States, policy is the biggest hurdle we have to actively engaging in the disinformation campaign. We're allowed to sit and listen and say things like that's disinformation over there. Um, look at these channels, look at the bot-like behavior, here's where we are, we've tracked these back, we've connected these to these voices, we know these are foreign malign influence, um, but we as a nation have such a hard time uh, proactively getting out and countering that or getting ahead of disinformation campaigns in a, in a broad way that would bring in sort of all of these tools and techniques together. Again, we're, 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 we are conducting campaigns for our federal customers all over the world every single day. Um, uh, I'm not at liberty to, to, to talk through exactly who all of those customers are, but we do have uh, defense and states, uh, other government agencies, uh, and some, some nonprofits and others that we work with uh, around the world. Um, we've got technology, sort of our, our technical pieces stuck um, into countries, you know, 30 different countries right now, and some of the hardest to reach places in the world. Um, so think about the hardest place that you could probably send a message. There's probably one of our Pulse Gateway phones sitting in that country uh, doing things. Um, and again, we're starting to see information backed actions uh, occur all over the world uh, because of these kind of things. And again, it's bringing together those three pieces uh, with, with great, um, technique and tradecraft uh, that gets you the ability to bring together a lot of data that helps inform decision makers and policymakers to move forward. And I think that's about my 10 minutes there tomorrow. So, Thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, we appreciate that. You're welcome. So we're going to turn over to Johanna and let's change a bit the sequencing. So Fata was, uh, is, is 
still trying to get on, and he'll be talking about the Georgian experience and Georgian uh, policy response as well as fact checking. We have a written transcript of his uh, uh, talking points as well, should there be an issue of us not getting him on. But we'll, we'll switch our sequencing a little bit to keep the flow and um, give the floor to Johanna. And Johanna will be talking about the power of entertainment education in providing accurate, truthful messages as a response to combating disinformation. Hi there. Let me just share my screen. Can you see that okay? Yes. Trying to make it full screen here. Shortcut's not working, but here we go. All right. Thank you so much, Tamara. And boy, I hope that Pata can make it. Um, I'm so excited to hear about his work, and it was great to hear about yours, Ryan. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we study and shape the impact of entertainment at the Norman Lear Center. We're a think tank based at the University of Southern California. We study media, entertainment, and society and its social impact. What I think is most distinctive about us is that unlike many other academic research institutes, we work very closely with the entertainment and media industries. A case in point, um, in the late 1990s, uh, the Centers for Disease Control started including some questions about, excuse me, <coughs> media and entertainment preferences um, in their annual health style survey. And they were shocked to discover that about half of Americans said that they thought that the health information in fictional storytelling on television was accurate. They thought it was vetted information. And about a quarter of Americans said that it was their main, one of their main sources of health information. So the CDC started looking more carefully at the entertainment education model something that's been around since the 1970s. And it's quite simple. It's really about incorporating educational and pro-social messages into entertainment programming, sort of finding audiences where they already are. And a lot of social science research over the last 50 years has discovered that this is a very effective way to reach hard to reach audiences and that this method can have a huge impact on audience members' awareness of topics, their knowledge about issues. Uh, it can actually trigger attitude changes and changes in behavior. So we entered into a cooperative agreement with the Centers for Disease Control and set, it up, set up a new program called the Hollywood Health and Society Program. And the main thing that this program does is provide accurate information to television storytellers. We have worked with hundreds of shows on dozens of networks um, and on the cable and streaming channels. Uh, in one five year period, we consulted, <coughs> excuse me, on more than 1100 storylines that aired so if you consider that a show like NCIS, which we consult with, can reach 18 million viewers in its first airing, you'll start to get a sense of the reach uh, of a program of this kind. We've worked with dozens of NGOs and government organizations and foundations, and this is really key to the model because these are the people who have the expertise. These are the people who hire Ryan to find out what's going on. And then they develop a plan on the topic that they understand best. We have lots of different activities, um, but primarily we do briefings and consultations, often one-on-one -on -one with television writers. And we develop PSAs to accompany content that airs so that we can track uh, calls to 1-800 numbers, for instance. And we put together transmedia campaigns, multi-platform campaigns that more deeply engage audience members in the stories that triggered their interest in these uh, important topics. 
So it's been crucial to us to measure the impact of this work, make sure that there is some efficacy to this effort. There are decades of research, as I mentioned, using social science tools to do this. We also have incorporated all kinds of new technology uh, to associate media exposure directly with a change in knowledge, attitudes, and behavior. Quite often we do some combination of a content analysis of the media messages, uh, an analysis of the media analytics, which include engagement metrics and reach metrics, obviously. And then we perform pretty complex survey research. Um, this is highly targeted research. Um, <coughs> excuse me, allergies. Um, we often construct uh, comparison groups in order to take into account uh, self-selection bias, which is the main problem when you're trying to do media impact assessments, trying to make sure that it was really this piece of entertainment that is correlated with a shift in knowledge, attitudes, and behavior. We also do experimental studies, we conduct interviews, and we do focus groups. A key aspect of our survey research is ascertaining to what degree audience members have been transported by a story. It turns out that this quite often is the crucial factor in positive outcomes. One quick example is this episode of Law & Order SVU where uh, this character Narda Lee in the upper left was seeking political asylum in the United States from the DRC. We found that people who scored really high on our transport, transportation scale were far more likely to support foreign aid, to have conversations about global health after they saw this episode, and also to know a lot more about immigration and asylum policies in the United States. In 2012, we established our Creative Alliance for Global Health and Sustainability. Uh, we had operations in India and in uh, Nigeria and we've just started working in Colombia. In India, we work with the Asian Center for Entertainment Education in Mumbai, and we have consulted on hundreds of storylines over the years, including one on this show, Hamari's Sister Didi, which is a nighttime soapy airing six times a week, which is exactly the kind of show we like to work with. We consulted on a lengthy storyline about the pentavalent vaccine, and as you know, in, in that part of the world and in many others, there's a lot of disinformation about vaccines out there. And so we were really excited to see that over time with regular viewers, we saw steady increases in the understanding of what the pentavalent vaccine protects against. We've also worked with Nollywood workshops on the ground in Lagos. Um, there we consulted with television shows, of course, and held briefings, but we also co-produced a film for the first time. This is a film about sexual violence. Um, it had a very broad viewership. We distributed free DVDs, which is the thing to do in Nigeria. And we were able to administer a large scale survey, finding that viewers of the film were very likely to have uh, uh, quite different attitudes from the norm about the acceptability of, social, of sexual violence in Nigeria. In 2013, we set up the Media Impact Project, which really takes all of the learnings from the Hollywood Health and Society program and extends them to uh, not only fictional television, but to documentary, to documentary film, feature film, and to all forms of news programming. One study that we conducted was on the feature film Contagion, which of course has experienced a resurgence in popularity recently. Um, and what we did was find out um, well after the fact, years actually, whether viewers had been affected by its messages. The film had been celebrated for actually being quite accurate, incorporating a lot of scientific uh, information. And thankfully so, because we found that the, that the movie actually had a profound impact on its viewers. Compared to very similar non-viewers, they were more knowledgeable about viruses, they were more likely to have prepared emergency kits. They were washing their hands more frequently and they were more likely to have talked to friends, family and neighbors about viruses. So I'm just scratching the surface here. As you can imagine, we have uh, a lot of studies available on our Media Impact Project site and on our Hollywood Health and Society site. And also please feel free to reach out directly to me if you'd like copies of any of these studies. 
Thank you. Thank you, Johanna. Thank you very much. So we, um, as we're waiting for our last panelists, we want to open up for a Q&A for Ryan and Johanna and are, are happy to take questions from the audience. But I think you'll have to type them in the chat function. Yes. So everybody, if you could put it in the chat um, function or the Q&A, right, the everybody Q is on mute. Yeah. The Q&A is a great place for those questions. We have one already. OK. All right, here's a question um, for, uh, for Ryan. Outside of COVID-19, what do you anticipate as other trends that might be influenced by disinformation? Um, and how would you uh, see that they might be impacted by what we're learning from COVID? What other trends um, are being impacted by disinformation that have a geopolitical influence? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're right in front of our face all day, every day um, today. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that we're keenly interested in are, are, are what are the uh, form line influences? And for us, we're specifically looking at Russia, China, uh, Iran, and to a lesser extent, North Korea. Um, these groups are absolutely celebrating uh, the chaos that our country, country is experiencing right now. So they're doing it very publicly, um, you know, talking about that's what you get for asking for riots in Hong Kong or, or Tehran or what, what have you. Um, but what we see are the sort of the, the lower level, softer side of influence inside of our, inside of our own conversations, right? So uh, things are happening there. We are seeing information being pushed into, um, into d dialogues that then further uh, separate uh, sort of what, what would we consider the two sides, right? The split screen on the news of two people yelling at each other. Um, and, and so we're seeing that all over the place. Uh, the other, the next you know, a strong point for us is going to be uh, the election and the election meddling. We are we we witnessed it in 2018 uh, during the interim. Uh, we're, we're brought to bear to sort of help with uh, proactive messaging back into certain areas, um, but but that's that's going to be the, the other area where that where things are going to play out in a uh, in a big way. Thank you. Um, a question for Johanna, what is being done by the center to address COVID-19 via mass media? Well, one of the things that we've been doing over the last, gosh, maybe six weeks now is having a weekly webinar um, in partnership with the Writers Guild of America, both East Coast and West Coast um, institutions are partners of ours. And so we host discussions about different topics related to COVID every week, inviting the public, but also more focused on writers who are working on storylines that are obviously COVID related. We wanna make sure that they have access to the uh, experts on various topics like hydroxychloroquine was one of our uh, panel discussions. Um, we're also, we also had a panel discussion about race and COVID um, so we feel that continuing to engage with the industry um, virtually as we are right here is really the way to continue the kind of work that we're usually doing in person. Thank you very much. And uh, another related question for you is around um, in, in terms of the vaccinations, do you expect the same level of hesitancy that you've seen in your work with other vaccinations to relate to COVID as well in terms of the mass uh, evaluations that you've done with your programming, Johanna? Well, I, I would really instead uh, uh, refer to a recent Nature article which um, determined that by looking at the volume and the spread of anti-vax sentiment within social media channels, the prediction is that that will be the standard uh, position on vaccinations opposed to the fringe response. So I think uh, scientists, um, social scientists um, and social media network analysis people are making it very clear to, to us that this is not just a fringe problem, 
but something that is very much entering a uh, mainstream discourse and um, affecting wide swaths of people. And so we see it as an absolute priority to address in storylines um, with uh, entertainment shows and, and obviously within news programming as well. Great. And one more question for you, and then we have a couple for Ryan. So how much research, Johanna, does the entertainment industry do before releasing new series or movies? And what is the incentive for them to work on that type of work for the fact-based evidence assessment and to put out more factual information? What's their motivation? That's such a great question. Um, and it's, it's really changed over the years, I'd say. Early on, um, we were really aided and abetted by uh, medical professionals who happened to be working within the inter entertainment industry. So the showrunner of ER, for instance, Neil Baer, was a medical doctor. And so he was really very influential in letting other showrunners know in Hollywood that we could be a really valuable resource in getting storylines right. And as you can imagine, writers don't like to get things wrong. And so if they can get the information and if they can turn it into something that's dramatic and engaging, they're more than happy to include accurate information. I must say things really shifted further in our direction when social media became something that was very widespread. It became much easier for people to call out shows for uh, misinformation and uh, inaccurate depictions. And so I think there was more pressure on the shows to actually get these storylines right. And I love it that social media has really been responsible for a lot more accountability within the industry. And, and also I must say, uh, there are personal reasons that people on TV shows will really engage in a, uh, in a long form storyline about a health topic, for instance. Sometimes all it takes is for a showrunner or a writer to have a personal experience with breast cancer, for instance, and that can turn into a nine month storyline on a soap opera. So there are various reasons. We also give awards um, to shows that do a really excellent job at showcasing um, a health issue. And so there are some incentives as well for recognition within the community for really doing a public good on the public airwaves. That's great to hear. So for Ryan, uh, what bot-like behaviors or lack of human behaviors are most indicative of automated or semi-automated campaigns online? And have you seen that change over time? Yeah, there's absolutely a, a global cat and mouse on, um, on, on bots and spam and, and, and things like that. So there, there's a couple of things that we look at. Um, one of the things we do is so we collect that all the metadata that comes from any one of the platforms as it comes in. And many of the platforms will talk about what, you know, sort of where that message entered the, the, the IP space. Um, uh, and so for instance, Twitter has a, you know, you know, if you look deep in a tweet uh, and all the metadata, you can detect what did this come off of? Did this actually come off of an Android phone or an iPhone or what have you, or did it come from a, uh, a media service, right? There's all kinds of media services that allow you to automate tweets as they go out. Um, and, and that's very easy to detect. Um, behavior, uh, the other thing, one of the other key pieces here is looking at sort of the, the networking and shared text homologies that, that go between things. Um, in our early counter human trafficking work, uh, we use this to find sort of uh, organized groups inside of uh, ad postings or forum postings where very similar language was being used and we could get similarity scores on those and understand which ones are, which ones are likely, likely tied together. Um, we are absolutely seeing the, the, the behavior change, right? I, I saw three years ago uh, a rack of probably 100,000 iPhones in a basement of an organization in China um, that were being used to actually have the message leave from a phone, uh, from an actual device to prevent some of those kinds of things. Uh, we have seen with some of our larger campaigns, uh, organizations like uh, WhatsApp um, uh, and, and others have very hardcore uh, counter spam technologies. We, we will see some of our campaigns get shut down really quickly uh, because from WhatsApp perspective, it, it, it looks like spam. Um, you know, for us, the, 
as we try to counter things, some of our customers just like to shout by a different microphone, right? That's been a thing that the microphone has been around for a long time, bullhorn and all that. And sometimes they just want to use a different medium, but continue to shout. Um, and what we talk about is being able to engage. And what, one of the reasons we talk about population engagement being a two-way thing is you get to engage with those things. And then as you're putting out messages, either automated or semi-automated, um, people have chosen to enter into the conversation. Great. And another question for you, Ryan, in, in the work that you've done and what you're able to discuss, when you've used the data and, and provided it to a, a customer, have you seen any early successes of, of counter narratives working in, in after your social uh, listening? Yeah, so um, we've, we've got customers of whom we don't share their data. We've got customers uh, who are very happy to share data. Um, and we've got customers, uh, and, and, and we're our own customers sometimes, and we will go out and do things uh, for us as a, as a mechanism to experiment with new uh, techniques or new technologies, uh, or just because it's, it's part of our mission of, of, of human, protecting human security around the world. Um, uh, and so sort of the sharing and, and, and what can happen from that depends on, on who that customer, who that customer was, uh, you know, very specifically. And I, and I think, uh, I think my colleague, Chris White uh, at Microsoft would be happy with me saying this. They asked us to come in and start looking from a social listening perspective on COVID at both misinformation and disinformation. Um, right. And there is a, there is a big difference between the two of those, but they can have the exact same outcome. Um, just somebody sharing the thing that they're, cousin shared with them and that becoming a thing and they're what we call a boundary spanner right there they're a group that goes into a larger other subgroup of of of, of talkers um you know those two things are are are, are always present that the disinformation work that we looked at um uh, focused on those countries that really try to control the internal narratives of, of their nations um in ways that uh, that we in the <laughs> prefer not to do so we think it is easy to detect um, and we have seen uh, uh, one specific customer who is absolutely changing the way they, they reach out based on, based on things that, that we're seeing come back in. Uh, we, we are finding folks uh, willing to now realize that the, the full spectrum of the information environment is required to, to get after some of these problems. Great. Another question here for both of you is how effective are volunteer networks who flag and monitor media for disinformation? What is the role of those networks, if any, in the work that you do? The human side of fact checking on uh, on different social media. We, in, I'll speak from IST's perspective. Um, so we think the idea of volunteers or citizen monitors or those that will come into this process are are, are instrumental. Right? There's there are things that come there are things that come from many eyes looking at at a problem that you can't get from, from just data, right? There are small, nuanced, locally regional messaging that happens um, that sometimes computers still really stink at, at, at picking up. Um, and if you look at, one of the things I always look at is sort of the security and uh, the security software development uh, side of things, right? They, they use volunteers all the time to, to hammer at their technologies and those that are written in an open uh, format like Signal, right? So they, 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 they publish all of their code. They ask everybody to look at it. Uh, they take that feedback, I think could be a model that can come back at, um, back at the, the disinformation campaign. One of the things that concerns me here in the United States is the disinformation, fake news, all of that ends up becoming immediately politicized and it's one side or the other rather than people actually looking at facts. Um, so I think that's a problem yet to be solved. Okay. Um, I'd say it's, uh, it's through the mechanism of our transmedia campaigns that we conduct uh, in partnership with our funders um, who really have the expertise on the topic and with the TV show. Uh, which has such a broad reach. And so that sort of combination of voices can really amplify something that might seem like a very nerdy topic to us. But once it's been put into the context of a really compelling show that has millions of viewers and fans, and they have an opportunity to engage around the factual content that informed that television storyline, that's really how we mobilize social media networks to lift up those voices and to really get people on the ground talking about what they've seen. So we see the storyline as really a trigger for citizen discourse. Okay. 
Great. Um, and one question for you is, what are the key elements of a storyline that you've seen works to accept behavioral changes or ad adopt different viewpoints? And, and how would you do this for, for COVID-19 or future outbreaks? What approach would you use? Yeah, I think um, the standard approach that has been used since the 1970s is to really model behavior um, and we have found that people are most likely to hear a message if it comes from somebody that looks like them. And so, for instance, um, we discovered that there was a myth within the African American community that breast cancer was a white woman's disease. And in part, this was driven by the fact that there had been no depiction of an African American woman with breast cancer on any mainstream broadcast television show ever. And so we went to Grey's Anatomy and said, this needs to change. And uh, it's that kind of relationship between people who are looking for information about their own lives. Some people are just not necessarily represented in these storylines. And once they are, it can have a very profound impact on their lives. Our research has demonstrated that the, the, the greater similarity between the characters who share information about a topic like COVID, for instance, and an audience member will correlate with much higher knowledge levels, awareness, and, um, and uh, the uh, behavior change that really is the primary result that we like to see from these health interventions in particular. If I can tack on to that, there's sort of there's one example that, that came across my mind specifically from Hollywood that gets at some of this some of the disinformation side of things. And, and I don't want to get into the, the goodness, the badness, whatever political side the show Homeland um, had. But their latest their latest season talked about Russia's active measures campaign, active disinformation how it works at this, at, this, at this high level. It's not just about a bunch of bots. There are actual people in places injecting things in, knowing exactly where the networks are, setting up some bots. And you know, I, I won't talk about the fact that the National Security Advisor like, got kidnapped three times in one series and, um, and like the three guys in a room in a closet writing code solved the problem. But it was one of the, it was one of the first representations I've seen in Hollywood that talks about the fact that there are active outside influencers trying to decide how we as a nation talk about things. That's great. Thank you. And we have wonderful news as we've been answering your questions and, and very much eagerly awaiting our speaker, Pata Gabrindashvili, is joining us. He is the executive director of the Georgian Reforms Associates and a former government official and a diplomat and has brings a tremendous knowledge of policy, information, media literacy, and a range of things that work in a a very exciting context, uh, Georgia. And thank you so much, Pata. Apologies for our unexpected um, Zoom fun. So we're gonna give you as much time as you need, ensuring that we have a, a keep a few minutes for Q&A, but thank you, everybody. Right, can you hear me well? Hello to yeah. everyone. Yes. Yeah, okay. Wow, that shows you how much technology really matters. <laughs> But I'm 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 really happy that we we with all these efforts we I feel, I, I finally made it and I'm really happy to be a participant of this webinar. I suppose uh, our dear panelists have talked already. Yes, yes. It's now we've we've talked uh, we've done our presentations and and answered some questions and now it's it's okay. all here. Yeah. All right then and. Um, I will, I will try to be to be short, and well, of course, the topic for for today's webinar is truth in the age of COVID nineteen steps to combating disinformation. You know, um, truth is love is always needed, uh, and I I love really one expression uh, which belongs to American Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and he once put it. Uh, everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not uh, his own facts. And we all want, you know, this kind of approach to prevail. Uh, of course, 
I think you talked about already, there can be state actors as well as non-state actors who spread this malign uh, disinformation. Uh, and I will, I will very briefly, uh, I'll try to talk about first and foremost, uh, uh, Kremlin uh, orchestrated disinformation uh, and hybrid warfare, warfare in general. Uh, uh, you know what I want to say uh, to all, the past several years, the Kremlin has come under increased attention, of course, for its hybrid warfare against well-functioning of the Western liberal democracies. But the issue is this, uh, when the global attention was almost stuck in the blunt lexis of, of fake news, uh, Kremlin was already sharpening it further its hybrid warfare toolkit, including disinformation and propaganda. Uh, but still, this very term hybrid could be still puzzling to some. Uh, and let me give you a quick flavor, of course. The current hybrid warfare entails disinformation operations that might be uh, continued with cyber attacks and cyber attacks with green man invasion or all those in combination. And that is what happened, for instance, as we all know, in Ukraine in 2014, when we saw a coordinated disinformation, then the cyber attacks on the electricity network uh, followed by Spetsnaz occupying buildings in Crimea. But long before Ukraine, Georgia has been a test road uh, for Russia in that regard. And Georgia faced a massive propaganda campaign, for instance, in 2005 and 2009, well before, you know, this term disinformation, propaganda uh, uh, have become, so to speak, trendy. And that was accompanied with cyber attacks, economic embargo, uh, sabotage on electricity lines, etc., and culminating with a full-scale war, into, unfortunately, in 2008. Therefore, it is important to look at the threat of disinformation, not as an isolated phenomenon, uh, but rather in a wider context of Russian uh, hybrid warfare, where the information operations represent just the tip of the iceberg. And that is why uh, the ever-increasing massive and targeted disinformation campaign with more and more you know, more and more dangerous narratives, if you will. For instance, on the Health Research Center, Public Health Research Center, named after Senator Luger in Tbilisi, is increasingly worrisome. And since its, its, its establishment, there have been uh, uh, false narratives, of course, uh, systematically producing this, this information about the center. And we can talk about uh, 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 narratives later if, if we still have the time. So what I want to say is the following, unless effectively deterred with the ungrounding ultimatums even we increasingly hear, one may not exclude development of certain extreme scenarios. Now let me quickly touch upon the issue of uh, uh, effects and impact of the disinformation as sort of a continuation of what I've said already. Now, even though it has been quite long enough that the world started remunerating about the disinformation threats, COVID-19 pandemic unfolded some of the visible uh, effects and impact of the disinformation, that, something that have not been tracked that clearly previously. Uh, well, from selling fake coronavirus uh, cures online, giving false uh, health advice, attempts to downplay or inflate the threat of the disease, uh, to perhaps even a cyber attack on hospitals, critical information systems, Adversaries, well, like Russia in our case, are exploiting the, and not only in our case, are exploiting the COVID-19 crisis, okay? Um, and it was, I think, Director General of the WHO first who labeled um, uh, it uh, not just fighting against uh, uh, epidemic, but fight against infodemic. Uh, and he was referring to the fake news, of course, that spreads, uh, I'm quoting, faster and more easily than the virus, end of quote. And generally, of course, it's not that easy to see clear-cut examples of how uh, disinformation could impact either public attitudes or their behavior. However, COVID-19 accompanied disinformation have resulted in setting 5G towers on fire, having incentivized people from either taking false medication, for instance, in Georgia, it could be the case in other countries as well. Some people drank uh, 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 hot water uh, as a treatment to the COVID infection and burnt their, therefore burnt their esophagus and throat 
uh, are not obeying the hygienic rules, of course, due to the conspiracies that portray coronavirus as a, as a fiction. Now, very quickly, a few words about, uh, uh, about fact-checking, most importantly about fact-based messaging and policy dialogue. Uh, COVID-19 infodemic uh, has also clearly shown, of course, the importance of truths uh, in general and of the fact-checking activities. Uh, well, uh, just to let you know, uh, my organization, Georgia's Reforms Associates, was really the first in Georgia to introduce, so to uh, uh, say, fact-checking culture back in 2013 uh, by establishing fact-checking uh, program, and since then, we have published more than 3,000 research-based articles uh, investigating statements made by uh, mainly Georgian public officials, not only uh, 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 and exposing this information, hot talks, etc. You know the stuff. During the pandemic and we, well before, uh, it also uh, we, we, we and that is very important, of course. And I think you talked about already. We try to find sort of user-friendly formats to better outreach our readers and provide factual pieces through the forms of posters, visualizations, walk style short clips. That is quite difficult, I would say. Um, and some other, some, some other means as well. Our activities have, of course, two main targets, and that is political uh, elites, so to speak. And we try to make them more accountable to the citizenry. Uh, and secondly, the public in general, and we we, 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 we are trying to increase their media literacy and helping them, and we try to help them to make informed choices, of course, at the election booth. Uh, so when it comes now to influencing policy dialogue, FactCheck has already proved, and I'm very proud of that, to be an impactful initiative, or somewhat impactful initiative in Georgia. And apart from actively engaging with citizens, including in the regions, and that is very important, we have had already dozens of cases uh, of MPs waving, you know, literally waving uh, fact checks articles as a proof of their argument at the parliamentary uh, or committee uh, sessions. And fact check has been named as kind of a uh, Georgian uh, political Wikipedia, if you will, owing to its broad coverage of a wide range of public policy issues. And now I'm, of course, uh, was asked to, to, to speak about what lessons can one draw from our experience and uh, how I also would define the ways to move forward. Now, uh, when it comes to public outreach, and that's, of course, extremely important, online fact-checking solely cannot cure all the disinformation evils, of course. During the pandemic, we have substantially increased uh, uh, our only uh, online outreach with over half a million reach per week. And that is quite uh, something, uh, especially in the country of just 3.7 million population. However, without proper engagement with Facebook and other tech companies, as well as cooperation with traditional media, such as TV, fact-checking activities alone can be a solution to the disinformation. So no matter how much is fact-checked by organizations like us, if tech companies do not support uh, to the work of this type, this information will continue spreading faster than uh, COVID-19. So the solution lies in synergies and increased cooperation among all the relevant stakeholders. With regards to Facebook, for instance, there are initiatives of partnering with third-party fact-checkers, opening up CrowdTangle, for instance, for them, and proper labeling of this information on the social media could substantially increase uh, the effects of the counter disinformation uh, efforts, including the fact checking. Now, effective ways of countering this information, as I say, go beyond fact checking. That is an essential part, of course, uh, of counter disinformation measures, but not enough. And what is needed can be summarized in three words, and that is whole of society approach of dealing with disinformation and hybrid threats. This approach entails the cooperation and coordination efforts not only between the fact-checking organizations and media or fact-checking organizations and Facebook even, but of all the stakeholders, including the governments, parliaments, education institutions, CSO, private sectors, tech and cyber companies. And of course, when we are talking about COVID-19, for them, then it is also doctors and uh, healthcare specialists who need to be a part of counter-disinformation efforts. 
So it is an approach that brings together a strong network of stakeholders together with common goals, consensus on threats, and importantly, countermeasures, together with proper tech and cyber backup, of course. I think I've at least given you a flavor uh, first, what's really been happening in, in, in Georgia and also how we would be uh, willing to contribute to, to other efforts as well. So thanks again to all and uh, I hope that I will get the chance to, to get the talking points of my dear colleagues who really spoke <laughs> before thanks. myself. Thank you very much. And I know we're running close on time. So we have, uh, when I give concluding remarks to our Johanna and Ryan, you know, your parting thoughts about what we should all think about as we are working to, as Pata said, a whole of society approach to start combating disinformation. And those of you who didn't have a chance to uh, get your questions answered, we will uh, answer them in the recorded version of this event. So thank you everybody for joining. One quick second for our, uh, Johanna and Ryan for parting thoughts, and thank you very much for Pata for setting the flavor and sharing your I mean, experience. <laughs> Zoom will <laughs> Zoom does work. It takes a, it takes a village. It takes a it takes a global community. So thank with you very much. With human efforts. Yes. Okay, Ryan to you and Johanna. Yeah. Thank you all for participants who have to log off. Thanks. I I, I just think it was it's great that you guys sort of put these three voices together because it's going to take all three of these things, right? Our data stuff is cool data stuff, but without the deep, rich media that happens that really does affect behavior at, at large levels, um, uh, you know, it means nothing. And if, and if the, and if, and if the government's not behind it, uh, as Pasa said, and, that, and doesn't come in strongly to, to support them, uh, you know, then we're all just shooting BBs rather than uh, a, a full spectrum uh, approach. Thanks, Ryan. Johanna? I think all of us, to some degree, were talking about the power of effective storytelling and engagement, finding people where they are, and asking them to contribute to a conversation about socially crucial topics. I think this is a key part of any sort of model to shift uh, opinions and to uh, share accurate information around the world. It's not just broadcasting really sexy storylines, it's also finding a way to get people to engage in them and feel like they have a stake in the conversation. Sure, and one quick comment perhaps on sure. the yes, yes, please. Of society approach is that, of course, when we are talking about the essential roles of the governments and authorities, first and foremost, we mean these essential roles of them in democratic countries, because of society approach is needed uh, from the side of the democratic governments and civil society entities and their coordination in order to counter this information and malign efforts of adversaries, which are not democratic. Okay, that's that should be very much, of course, uh, 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 clear. Yeah. So as we, as our panelists and the audience has provided us great uh, content to think about on when we are looking at how we can combat disinformation, it is a integrated approach. It includes data analytics, it includes storytelling, and it includes really understanding the motivations and social science of our communities and cultures and working to promote those values that we all believe. And I, I really appreciate everybody's patience with our technology. This is our first dialogue. We hope to have many more. Uh, they will be seamless or they will be, you know, full of conflict. That's what the world, <laughs> uh, unexpected, unexpected issues. So thank you again for, for all of your participation. Thank you again to our esteemed panelists for joining us and making us think. If you have other questions, please send us to, to us and we'll be happy to uh, continue this dialogue log online. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.